welcome to the Conquer Risk podcast. I've got Manish Kata here with me. Uh, my name is Jeff Goodnow, and certainly we want to dig into an interesting topic for us, something that's really been on the forefront, and that is hiring, training, and retaining uh, you know, for advisors. Uh, for us, we're an advisor, right? We've had to go through this, and it can, it can be brutal. <laughs> It, frankly, it can be fun or it can be brutal. It's it's you know it's both sides of the spectrum. So, you know, in, in short, we want to hit all three of these categories because because we in our discussions have felt like if you don't sort of complete the circle, you just end up uh, that little hamster in the in the wheel. So, uh, as we we touch on hiring first, Manish, uh, you know, you've made a couple of points in some other podcasts, and uh, one of which was was about the fact that we have a little different perspective. So let's address why we're a little different, but how it can also affect advisors moving forward. Okay. I, I think it's important to touch on why we're doing this to begin with. Uh, we, yeah. We've had some pretty explosive growth over the past, uh, you know, I don't know, six to nine months. And as you build out your team, you lay out, you know, who you're supposed to add to, to different departments. And this has come up. And we're learning on the fly, and you and I have talked, and Jennifer as well. We're like, look, what are other advisors doing? This is a pretty important topic uh, as advisors build out their practice. So uh, I think the first important thing for us is because we're 100% remote, and we've mentioned this before, is the, you know, all of a sudden, you know, (laughs) your application or your applicant pool is now the entire country. Um, and whereas before you would only have a, a 20 to 30 mile radius that you would have to focus on. And, and that's actually a good thing because it, it's, it, it whittles down the list, right? You know, whereas now, you know, you're, you're literally, you know, have this job application across the country and, and, and the amount of uh, applicants that come in is, is pretty, pretty large. So I think that the first part of that uh, hiring process is, trying to figure out a way to whittle that down. Uh, and, and you have to do that in the filters you set when you post these jobs. Right. Well, it, this is this is where I think it's interesting, right? Because on one hand, it, it can be a little frustrating that the pool is so much bigger. On the other hand, if you think about how many advisors there are sometimes in areas where maybe there's just not, you know, you've gone through the more traditional methods and the, the, the pool just isn't big enough. And now all of a sudden there is the opportunity to stretch that out. And so you have a, a chance for maybe better candidates than what you can just find in your local small area, especially if you're a more rural area. Yeah, and, and we, always, we always start with the referrals, like anything. Call your friends, Absolutely. your colleagues. Do you have anyone? Do you know anyone? Uh, and, and however, at the same time, you also have to do the job posting because all the referrals will ask you, like, all right, well, send me the posting. Uh, and so, you, you know, you really have to do those things together. And we've tried everything. Uh, one of th- the most success, at least that, that I think, w- has come from LinkedIn. Uh, if you're looking for a job and you're not on LinkedIn, you know, you're probably not a candidate to begin with, in my opinion. Um, it, it has the, the strongest database. It has the uh, strongest filtering and also uh, reviewing capabilities where you can actually, you know, sort through resumes, uh, request that the applicant maybe send a video to introduce themselves. There, there's a lot of powerful functionality behind LinkedIn. So in the past, we used to do different job boards and maybe Indeed and Monster, and now it's just 100% LinkedIn. We're not doing anything else, uh, of course, outside of referrals, but but LinkedIn is the number one uh, way we're going uh, about trying to get applic- applicants. You know, that's an interesting... I ha- Honestly, I hadn't even thought about that yet, but this is, this is like a light bulb moment for me. I know this sounds really dumb. We've talked about Soapbox as an example. Well, that's a free tool that anybody outside of our industry could use. So all the more reason, right, you, you see you a, a person who's looking for a job sees an application, an opportunity with a firm. You do a little bit of background research. You see, oh, well, you know, hey, you can respond and use a tool like that, or there's many others, right, and do that video intro right out of the gate. Yeah, I know? mean, that. listen, that, I appreciate that, the opportunity. I, that sounds fine, Dandy. That's an awesome idea. Uh, I have had not one person do that. I know, but that's that's my point, right? Who is it is doing the research? Who is it that, especially if it was a marketing type of role or, a, you know, whatever, right? There's opportunities out there, and I, I think it's interesting this day and age to see who is going to really take that step, and that could be a differentiator. Yeah, and so I, I think full disclosure, uh, I, 
I have not applied for a job for 19 years, so I <laughs> I also have no idea what the f- I'm talking about. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> that's a whole different issue. Yeah, that's a whole different issue. Oh my goodness. Um. All right. So, I mean, in regards to anything else in, in the hiring process, I mean, one of the things that you know, you kind of mentioned Monster. Are there any other tools that you really have seen success with? Uh, I mean, besides LinkedIn. No, is that really yeah, just pretty much the yeah, standout. Yeah, we've by we, we've whittled it down. There's we use nothing else but LinkedIn at this point. I got gotcha, you. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. All right. Well, that next step, though, let's assume that you've found a good candidate, right? You've you've done your research. You've you've got some candidates. They they you whittled it down, right? You did your interviews, whatever, and yeah, you have somebody. This is the part that recently I have been uh, enlightened. Uh, because it's been years since I trained anybody. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things that you forget how hard of work it is. Um, Training is not easy if done well. Uh, It takes a lot of time and effort. And so can you speak to some of those avenues, things that we've learned in the process? I know Jen's done a bunch of training with operations. You know, you've done some training recently. So uh, let's touch on that. You know, I, I think the way I was trained ruined me to train people because I was just handed, you know, for when I started, it was uh, Fidelity Advisor Channel, which which we were trading in, and I was just handed the manual and knock yourself out, learn how to do it, and and that kind of yeah. ruined me because you can't do that. You really do have to sit down and and frame out something. So what we did recently is we framed out uh, a three to six week onboarding uh, using software where we break down. You know the the different things this new uh, staff member is going to do, including things like talking to owners about culture and history, talking to marketing about what their role is, and, and really laying out where this employee gets uh, a piece of every department. And I think that's important because, from what I can tell, a lot of times you know a new employee comes in, let's say they're doing trading and billing, and operations, whatever, and you focus on that specific thing and and i think that's a mistake you really have to give them a taste of the culture the people how we do things how we expect things to happen uh and and so it's really come to me it's it's laying out that framework and you don't have to follow it to a t right it's this is not uh um surgery here you you lay out a framework and you have to adapt as you go along but but you have to really lay that that um those guidelines out yeah this is i would agree this is something that um you know, I, I think is is probably missed by a lot because especially the owner or the advisor maybe is busy doing whatever. And they, if they do already have any sort of a team, they're handing that off and just letting the team train them. And, and maybe never takes the time uh, to, you know, engage with that person. And I, I think that's vital. It's, uh, you know, I've grown most of my career. I've been very fortunate where I've had open door policy sort of mindset and culture uh, at the good places that I've worked. And I think the only way to do that, right, is to start at the very beginning and say, hey, my name's Jeff. This, this, is, this is what I'm doing. Tell me a little bit about you. Let's get to know each other, uh, you know, if I can help with anything, you know, and have whatever the, uh, the agenda speaks to, right? Is it talking about a certain defined role or is it talking about a certain culture, et cetera? And have those discussions so that that, that, that new employee does feel open and available to, uh, you know, to have a conversation. Well, so I, you know, we're all big believers, you know, customer service isn't just the responsibility of the people answering their phone. Customer service is everyone's responsibility. Uh, and, and I think training is the same thing. Training, if you hire operations, it's not just operations who's responsible for training. It's everyone. And, and that's something that, you know, should be, uh, advisors should gravitate to is making sure that the they get every piece of the company because it is it's you know we're a big organism and you have to know uh, every part of it uh, i was on a podcast uh, that we all watched with uh, seven lab where you know response times are huge here you know and i want to bring this one example and then we can move on it, it you know we have a saying here that listen you have to respond to an advisor with 20 within 24 hours typically within the same business day um, and let's say someone comes in from another culture, like a larger company, where you know maybe it's okay for three to five day response time. It's not that that employee's bad or, or that they were trained wrong. It's just not how we do things. So those expectations need to be set right away. And and the longer you wait to set those expectations, I, I think the the worse outcome you may have. 
You know, that's interesting because I'm going to give you an example of the exact opposite. And that was one of the first firms in this industry that I worked for uh, was uh, part of their part of part of the company was the insurance field. And I thought it was interesting as the expectation was set, there was a certain particular uh, line of insurance products had a 45 day response window. I mean, that's how much time that was just given ahead of, or, or in advance. And so basically the instruction was uh, wait 40 days and then start processing. Right. So, I mean, it's that sort of mindset is not the same in every company. And, and I think it's ludicrous. I mean, at the time, I just immediately that told me something about the company. Uh, I wasn't there very long, but, um, you know, that's that's not the same way. And you do have to set those expectations up front. Now, uh, as we move on to something, we've touched on some of the different tools and things that that are used in our industry and that we use in the past, um, you know, and and. Part of this training, I think, a different way or approach to look at it is even like the use of a camera, right? Having those conversations we were just talking about as we, we you interject or interact with different people in the company are opportunities to practice using the camera. And and this is something for, uh, for our firm anyway is very important that you have that ability to interact with from a customer service level, from an education level, um, you know, to interact with advisors and their teams. So um, those interactions we were just talking about are, are, are great opportunities to use some of those, like the Logitech camera, or the, the webcam, and Zoom, and all those fun things. Uh, are there any particular tools that you think are important from a training aspect? Yeah, I mean, I think it's everything we use to run the business, you know, uh, the, the accountability from a task-based software, um, you know, enforcing uh, Zoom calls uh, as much as you can to have that personal interaction. Um, and recording your screen um, uh, to, if you do a, a repetitive task, uh, making sure that's recorded and then uploaded into uh, a teamwork type software. So that way, when that person comes in, you know, they can see that process uh, through video or, or whatever method you want to upload that to. So I, I think it just comes down to everything we, we use to run the business, whether it's teamwork, HubSpot, Zoom, et cetera, and, and enforcing those, those policies. All right. Well, this is one that uh, is, is valuable to me. I, I, I had a, a, a great moment years and years. Shit, it was almost 20 years ago uh, at a former firm. I, it was my first national conference, and I was emceeing a couple of the top producers talking about their their teams. It was interesting. It was a couple of top producers that were large offices, right? They had a number of staff members. And then there was a, a not quite a top producer, but in, in, by their ratings, but another really good advisor that was solo, right? And it was talking about um, how they're, they're key people in their, in their team. And the takeaway to me was it was really interesting as both of the big offices had people, had good people, and then those people left. Why? Well, you know, salary, bonus, uh, re, uh, you know, all kinds of the things that we... Uh, fall under retention, right? How do you how do you treat people? How do you compensate people? Benef all kinds of the benefits. That's the word I was thinking of, right? Th those are the kinds of things that they both realized, and I thought this was interesting. Both of them had the same epiphany. Both of them went back out and got those people back, and therefore, from that point forward, had changed the way they treat employees. From a retention standpoint, we all know anybody who's ever heard anything about sales knows that it's harder and more expensive to get new people, new clients, new prospects than it is to deepen the relationship with existing ones. And yet, what do many advisors do, many firms do, right? You go out and you hire and you do the whatever training and then you either don't treat them well, you don't pay them well, you don't have good benefits, you don't, right? There's a lot of things that I think we missed the boat on the last step and that's retaining. So there's my there's why this one is important to me what what thoughts do you have on retention as part of this three-legged stool yeah it this this all stops this starts from the top down so if you own a company you look at employees one of two ways either they're an investment to the future and the growth of your company or they're an expense and a line item and 
you can run your business however you want. I'm not going to criti criticize someone for thinking of employees as an expense or a line item. That's your prerogative. Uh, you, if you do that, you're going to have to constantly, you know, hire, fire, retrain. You're not going to retain. So from the top down, we, we take the approach, look, if we're going to hire someone, we are going to treat them as an investment and put everything we can into them. I think what's important is starting with a framework. So if you sit down and do your budget and you say, all right, let's say a general framework, a third of your revenue goes towards employees, a third of your revenue goes to reinvestment uh, expenses, et cetera, and then a third maybe goes to, to, uh, to owner profits or whatever you want to call it. By setting that framework, then you can work backwards and, and, and start filling out you know, who you need to run the firm and how you're going to pay them. I think a lot of mistakes happen when you reverse that and say, all right, what's the least amount I can spend on an employee to run this company? And, and that, that is a horrible way to, to think about it. I think you need to go above and beyond and make sure. And that doesn't always mean that you overpay and you have to spend all your money on salaries. You know, there's, there's different components of employee happiness. Is money a big part of it? Well, of course, you're damn right it is, right? <laughs> That's, it'd be stupid not to think that. But there's other parts of that. There's other ways to deliver that. And so, you know, we, we've changed a lot, right? You know, I was brought up in this industry by, honestly, you know, and this is going to come across bad, as, as people who thought, uh, you know, employees are replaceable parts of a, of a, of a big ship. Um, and, and that's not the case. So everything you do should start from the employee being an investment uh, and, and take it from there. That, that's step number one. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I would agree. It's, uh, it's easy to look at the dollars and cents, but one of the words we used earlier is culture, and I think that that can be an important part too. Um, you know, it's not just the dollars and cents, but it's the whole package. And so I, I think it's good for advisors to occasionally either A, elicit feedback from their existing employees, right? But, but also be aware of what culture you're creating because... You know, we say this all the time, right? Life's short. We don't want to partner with people that are assholes. Well, guess what? I, I, my compensation might, as an employee, might be, it's important, but I also don't want to work somewhere that I don't like, right? So what things are you doing to, to, to make the world, uh, you know, the job more interesting, yeah. more fun? And uh, those sorts of things. That's well, just a little di different perspective beyond money. Yeah, and let's talk about some of those things. And and so, you know, I think first and foremost is you know, vacation, PTO. Like this is, I've seen different arguments about, you know, unlimited vacation being good or bad or whatnot. But, you know, in a remote company, frankly, I, I have no idea what people are doing anyway. Like as long as the job gets done, <laughs> I have no idea where you are or what you're doing. You know, if you're at a resort doing work and it's done, what the hell do I care where you are? So... You know, it's it's not necessarily unlimited vacation. You know, you can't take two months off, but it's not, also not going to be, you know, tracked and, and, and over your shoulder, right? So it's it, it comes down to taking accountability, getting the job done, and doing what you have to do. I, I'd never want a situation where an employee has to juggle their time off so they can go to their kid's school uh, uh, to, to watch a, a play or, you know, have to take their kid to the doctor and worry about PTO. That's not a good way to run your business, right? So number one was was PTO. We we put some things in place there, and then also uh, you know beefing up the retirement plan. Uh, I had a call with the the plan provider, and their first thing was uh, the first response to me was, "Well, don't you want to maximize your uh, contribution as an owner?" And I'm like, "Well, not really. I want to make sure everyone is is taken care of equally," and, and they were kind of in shock because every S Corp that's ever come to them, the S Corp owner maxes out, right? You can do fifty, sixty thousand dollars in your own, um, and then, you know, you distribute the rest to your employees. And I said, all right, let's do it differently. Why don't we say, you know, we we try to make this equal. Um, and so, you know, we did a couple of unique things with our plan where, you know, it, we up the matching to 6% and then we do some discretionary profit sharing plan contributions at the end of the year, depending on the success of the company. So uh, based on AUM and revenue and things like that, you know, we can make a discretionary contribution into that. So it's, it's every avenue, right? You have PTO, you have um, uh, profit sharing plan and then things like healthcare, right? We, we always have this discussion, like how can you, um, you know, beef that side up? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, this year we 
you know, you brought to the table, was it Qsera? Yeah, I should always screw up the acronym, right? But th there are, are different options, and, and I thought it was interesting. You and I discussed ahead of time, well, what, it's one thing for, and you've done the majority of this work for our company, for sure, right, where you go look at umpteen different plans and try and bring back, well, here are a couple that, that make sense and give people a choice. Um, we've also gone, like last year, I think we really just had one because of the nature of our smaller company and, and where we were. But the opportunity to say, okay, well, here, how about we compensate you or reimburse you would be the right phrase, right? A certain dollar amount, and then you can go get whatever plan you want at your particular state, and you can do your own research and find what works for you, HSA, PPO, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I think that's overwhelming. But as a regular employee, I was for many years, right? It was just, okay, well, whatever's there. Healthcare is the last thing I want to do research on, to be frank. And so it's like, how fast can I make a determination between two choices? Um, and the opportunity to open that up, I think, is a scary one. But it's good to know that that option was there because you brought it to my attention. I had no idea that was even an option. Uh, what's it, the acronym? You, yeah, you, it is you Coursera know, where you can do the reimbursement. Coursera, okay. And we, we haven't necessarily decided on that yet. I, I think right. here's where healthcare is, is a part of compensation. Uh, you, know, you, you do not want your employees to you know, go to the doctor and do the mental gymnastics game on how much they're going to end up paying out of pocket right? Uh, if, if you're able to cover uh, as many expenses as possible within the plan, they can then use that savings uh, for, for other expenses. It, it is a, a form of compensation. And, and, you know, I've changed my tune on this a lot over the years, because every time we sign up for the plan, it, it's, it's horrible, right? I mean, the amount of money that we are paying for healthcare is absurd. And there should be some shared responsibility with the employee. But there's a fine line between how you balance that. You know, if, if you put it all on them, then it, it's just it, it's a bad taste in people's mouth when they're having to, to put up so much of their, their own money to cover some of these expenses. Um, so you, you want to create a, a robust enough plan that they're not worried, um, but at the same time, you know, managing how that works. So once again, if you come at it from an angle, look, I'm going to spend 33% of revenue on salaries and or you know healthcare compensation whatever it may be then at the end of the year you know listen if you can afford it just do it just just get the best plan you can possibly get and, and move on you will have happier employees if you take that uh that stance um yeah. and once again it if you're going to treat them like a line item then healthcare is just another line item in your head that you want to reduce but if it's an investment then investing back in your back into your employees with with the best health care plan you can afford I, I think is a good investment well i think you said it best earlier right if you don't uh retain you'll have to retrain and there's the phrase of the day um you know we eat out different we shop different now we there's a lot of things over the last couple of years are, are different especially this last year and and it only makes sense that you maybe before your next hire you take some thought uh, take some time to give some thought to how you hire, train, and retain your current and future employees. So uh, as we move to, to recommendations, Manish, what, Manish, what you got? Uh, so uh, <laughs> Cobra Kai Season 3 is on. Uh, ah! Strike first, strike I'm hard. I'm halfway through. Halfway through, brother. Dude, I mean, through. look, some of it is just so cheesy, and you're like, Paige and I will be like on the couch looking at each other, laughing, like, why are we watching this? But then at the same time, you can't turn it off. Like, it's just. I know. And so, you know, we, I actually talked to Paige last night. I said, look, we should go back and watch older movies that we haven't seen for years, like some of the original Karate Kids uh, and, and other. Uh, you know, it's nostalgia for us to go back and watch that so anyway yeah. cobra kai season three you have to get launched uh new year's eve um right uh, just stick through it it's it's great entertainment so yeah well and obviously you have to watch one and two uh, the fact that they without without making it too dorky they they kind of make fun of themselves throughout the whole thing i mean the characters do they do things that just yeah it's a it's a hoot well this morning um, I, wait, hold on this morning i had to tell this I, I was talking i was having breakfast and i brought out something and and uh, my mother-in-law was in town and they were like you know just like looking at me weird like what are you talking about and i'm like hey come on that's badass and then uh, you know it i just get that look <laughs> if you watch it you'll understand but i've been i've been doing that a lot anyway Go ahead. yeah um all right so so i've got a weird one this is uh this was our thanksgiving dinner if you haven't traveled in the south 
where there are gas stations called Bucky's. Number one, Bucky's in and of itself is an experience. I, I, you can Google the snot out of it. It won't matter. Going to a Bucky's is an experience. The second thing is, okay, why on God's name would you think in God's name would you think that we're, Thanksgiving dinner might be there? I'm going to tell you their sliced brisket is that good. We literally went and got a couple pounds and and then brought it home on the night before Thanksgiving. And so the next day we we ate brisket from a gas station. Hey, listen, I don't I don't I, we you took me to Bucky's last time we were in Texas and I we were drunk at least well, I was drunk enough not to really know <laughs> what I was getting myself into, but I just grabbed a bunch of things. So it's a terrible review. But anyway, the point is, yeah, it's it's a lot more than a gas station at that point. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, true irony here, uh, Jason Lajita, our, uh, our PR guy, Street Cred, give him a shout out, right? He was he was one of the guys with us. So, uh, yeah, everybody get, needs to experience Bucky's if you haven't done so before. It's a hoot. Well, we, we, sh- we shout him out. Uh, and you know, we, we look for them when we're traveling. So anyway, on that note, thank you everybody for, for, uh, watching, listening, of course, Apple podcasts, Spotify, all those, whatever the umpteen different things we've got listed on our, our website for uh, locations. You can listen to the podcast, but we also have now for 2021, uh, move forward with the branding of our YouTube channel for Conquer Risk Podcast. All of the podcasts we do video record, so if you're really bored or want to see what these two goofy guys and, and the rest of our team look like when we're doing these things, you can always watch a video and take a little mental break from some of the other things that you have to do during the day. On that note, we're out. See you. Thanks. Thanks.